about to join Don Newen, co-host of Cowboy Logic Radio, and Denise Simon, host of the Denise Simon Experience, for a weekly situation report, or sit rep. 18 hours a day, Denise Simon lives her life as an intel analyst. 18 hours a day, Don Newen lives his life in the world of rock and roll. One hour each day, Newen receives a daily sit rep from Simon. Welcome to the Drive Time Situation Report. Fasten your seatbelt. You are now in Don Newen's car, and he is calling in for his sit rep. Hello. Hey, what's up, Nisi? Hello, Mr. Don. I am ready to rock and roll tonight. I am ready to rock and roll. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Drive Time Situation Report. I have put my car in D for drive, and we are headed home. We got one Denise Simon on the end of the other end of this conversation, and this is called the Drive Time Sit Rep. My name is Don Newen. I'm the co-host of Cowboy Logic Radio. Denise Simon is an intelligence analyst who unselfishly gives up her time so that I can appear to be more intelligent than I am. Right, Denise? (laughs) You're overselling me again. You're doing all right on your own. Well, I don't know about that because for the past five or six years, I've counted on you to update me on pertinent and sometimes information that nobody's talking about way ahead of the curve and then i simply regurgitate that and all of the cowboy lodger logic radio listeners think i know what i you know they think that comes from me but i credit you often oh shucks which is what it should be all right so ladies and gentlemen here's what's going on i'm in my car driving home after a long day at work Denise is hunkered down in her bunker, also known as a hunker bunker, and she is uh, talking to me via my cell phone, which is what you're hearing. This is unlike any other radio show. I don't know any other radio show host that drives around in his car once a week to do an hour-long radio show. I just, I'm not aware of it. Right, Denise? Are you? I'm not either. All right. Well, along with that type of a concept, which is proving to be successful based on the emails that we get, we can sometimes run into technical problems or logistical problems. I might get pulled over. Let's hope not. So far, I think we've made it through uh, at least a year of this show, and I haven't been pulled over. But you might hear some traffic going by. You might hear some highway noise. I might have to blow the horn. I might talk about hookers that are going to be up here in about three miles five miles from me we'll talk about them tonight i'll interrupt whatever you're doing denise and we'll talk about the crack whores that are walking around on fulton industrial boulevard i'll give you a cw update how's that Mm, that's okay i can pass yeah but you know what the listeners love it they love it they love the cw updates all right so at any rate ladies and gentlemen i got a rainy night in georgia it is raining you might hear the rain pelting who sang that Rainy night in Georgia. Gladys, Gladys Knight. No, it was a guy's voice. Oh, really? Oh, midnight she... train to Georgia was Gladys. Yeah. What about a what about a midnight train on a rainy night in Georgia? No, who sang Rainy Night in Georgia? Come on. Well, look it up. You're the Intel analyst. Yeah, but I'm working right, so on what... one computer. The other ones, I don't have a uh, working keyboard. All right. Well, while you're doing that. I want to tell you and our beloved listeners. Brooke Benton. The, who? Brooke Benton. No, no, no. That's not who did it. Yeah, it is. I believe I it's raining all over. <laughs> rainy night in Georgia, rainy night in Georgia. I believe it's raining all over the world. Come on. Seems like I hear your that, voice calling. It's all right. A rainy night in Georgia. That might, be, that might be who wrote it. That's not who recorded it. That's yeah, not he who did. made it a hit. Yeah, no, I've did. never even heard of the guy or gal or whatever it is. Neon signs flashing, taxi cabs and buses passing through the night. Okay. 
Well, you're the intel analyst. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody I've never even heard of, and I'm in the music industry. All right, so Denise, check this out. As you probably know from social media, Donna and I went down to the Trump Kemp event in Macon, Georgia yesterday. Were you aware of that? Yes. I'm here to tell you, there was a sea, a frickin' sea of people. It was, it was better than I had expected. We got there at about 11 o'clock. Now, Trump wasn't due to arrive until 4 p.m. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, we got there at 11 o'clock, and there was lines, and I mean multiple lines, different locations at this regional airport in Macon, Georgia. There were traffic lines. There were people lines. And again, I'm talking miles away. They had buses down there that were shuttling people from point A over to the, you know, to the place, the hangar where he was going to be speaking. There were lines coming out of every orifice in every pocket of this airport. So we get in there at about 11 o'clock. We park over by where Danny Hamilton, the owner of Star Coaches, parked the big Trump bus that we've been running around for two years. We took two buses down there because he had a bunch of people that wanted to come from Atlanta. Now, those buses were parked in the VIP parking area. That's where Donna and I rendezvoused with them. They were all already in the hangar in their VIP seats at 11 o'clock. Wow. So we end up getting into the facility that was wonderfully managed by the Secret Service. Wonderfully managed. We get in there probably 1130. Now, we were kind of moved to the front of the line because we had these credentials. Well, I'm telling you, by one o'clock, this place was starting to get really packed. And what they had, the way they had this thing laid out, there was a big hangar, and that's where all of the people behind Trump and Kemp, you know, those people that you see on the cameras, that's where they were seated. Mm -hmm. Now, Danny and Angie and all of the gang from, uh, from Star Coaches that rode down there, that's where they all were because they had these VIP passes. We didn't get there in time. So we were out front. Well, that place was already filled under the hangar by the time we walked in there at 1130. So I'm going to guess there maybe were uh, 1,500 people inside this hangar, maybe 2,000. Then you had the press stage, which was kind of cool because we got to, Donna and I got to see uh, Jonathan Sari because he was mm -hmm. down there reporting on this for Fox. Mm -hmm. and, and his producer, who we knew from, I mean, she obviously knew both these guys long before I did. But I met them back in the, about, I don't know, 2006, right around in there, five or six. But at any rate, we got to spend some time with Jonathan Sari. What a first class individual, just first class. Now, Donna decided she was going to mill around the press area and look at all the sourpuss faces on all the people from CNN and MSNBC and all these characters. Man, it looked like somebody had taken a crap in their bowl of Cheerios. They didn't want to be there. Sari, on the other hand, Jonathan Sari, had a nice smile on his face. He was happy to be there. So at any rate, this thing starts spilling out. Well, they've got blocked off all the way out into the tarmac, Denise, a section that's probably larger than a football field. And by 2.30, it was packed. Now we're all standing around waiting for Trump to show up. You know, Kemp speaks a little bit. And, uh, Vince Dooley came out. You remember Dooley. He came out, spoke. A couple of other people came out and spoke. Um, and then all of a sudden, here comes Air Force One. And it was real cool because, you know, they, they got to clear the airspace, right? Right, Denise? You, know, you, you still with I'm, me here? I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. All right, so they clear the airspace. Now, the reason I'm telling you people this 
is because Denise Simon is totally ready for these midterms to be over. So I'm filling a little time sharing some interesting and motivational stuff with you people. Denise, we were up on the front line. Holy cow. I just passed a wolf, Denise. A wolf? A wolf. Not a big dog. That was a wolf. Okay. That I just passed on Fulton Industrial Boulevard. That thing was huge. And there's a dude walking down the street that has no idea that about 100 yards behind him is a wolf. <laughs> All right. So at any rate, back to the Trump event. It was non stop people all the way back at least 100 yards, maybe further than that, maybe 150 yards. So about 340, in comes Air Force One. Well, that was pretty cool to watch, you know. The only Air Force One we've seen is the one at the Reagan Library. So that was kind of cool to see that one come in. We got to watch the Secret Service do their thing, the GBI, the military was there. You know, you had the snipers on top of the roof. It was It was pretty cool. And you know, clearly, I didn't go in there with a handgun. I wasn't carrying when I went in there. You can't. But I felt totally safe. Because why, you ask? Because <laughs> it was a hard target. It wasn't a soft target, right, Denise? Yes, sir. So, at any rate, Trump, you know, he gets everybody jacked up, and they're having a pretty good time. And the thing ends, Donna and I take off. We sit in traffic forever. And that was after we BSed around with Jonathan, Jonathan Sari to, to kill some time and have, have a good time with him. You know, we left, and it was they shut it down. We get outside, still traffic, trying to get out of there. Now, evidently, there was about 69,000 people that RSVP'd this event. There weren't 69,000 people there. Correct. But the estimates that we were hearing that we saw was someplace between fifteen and 20,000 right there on that hangar and tarmac. Mm-hmm. Now, we leave there. We take off, and we're starting to drive back to Atlanta, and we find that, you know, we're, we're a little hungry, so we stop in on the, out, the north side of Macon to get some dinner. And we decide we're going to go to this restaurant, you may have heard of it living down in Florida, called Bonefish Grill. No, it will. Okay. We walk up to Bonefish Grill in Macon, Georgia, and they got this sign stuck on the front of their building that says, while we appreciate your Second Amendment right, you're not allowed to come in here with a weapon. So we immediately turned around and we went over to Chili's and ate dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and here's why. I didn't have my gun on when I was at the Trump rally. But I felt safe. And the reason I felt safe, as we just discussed, that was a hard target. Bonefish Grill is a soft target. It doesn't get any softer than Bonefish Grill. Especially with a sign out front. Exactly. And the thing is, as you appreciate, and I'm sure all of our listeners appreciate, the entire reason that I carry a weapon, whether it's concealed or open, is to protect Donna and me from evil people. And if you can't do that because of, uh, of, a, of a target or a, a, a facility being a soft target, why go there? Why go there? Now, if Bonefish Grill were going to hire police or law enforcement to make sure that it was a hard target, then I would not mind leaving my weapon in the car and going in there and eating if that's where I wanted to eat. But as we've discussed before, and then I'm going to get off this soapbox, there is no law or legislation that can be passed that can protect innocent people from evil people or from an act of war. The only thing that can protect innocent people from evil is a hard target. No law, no legislation. So that's why we didn't eat at the Bonefish Grill in Macon, Georgia. And any of you other people that are Second, Second Amendment loving people that feel like it is your absolute right to be able to protect yourself, don't go to the Bonefish Grill in Macon. They won't let you in if you're carrying. All right, Denise. How did you like that little tirade? All righty then.
Did you like my description of what happened at the Trump rally? Yes, well done. It was a it was a fun time for all, Denise. All right, good deal. All right, so why don't we time stamp this show so that the <laughs> listeners that are listening to this on Wednesday night will realize that it's actually Monday night. <laughs> well, it's eight forty two p.m. Eastern. I don't know, Eastern time now, because we went through a time change, didn't we? So it was just Eastern time, Eastern Standard yeah, we, time. We, we fell back, which I was grateful for, because Donna and I had to, like, get up at 6 o'clock in the morning on Sunday to get to this trumpet event. <laughs> Woo! Didn't want to do that. On the 5th of November, in the year of our Lord, 2018. Very well done, Denise. So this show is being recorded the night before... The most the important midterm elections in my life and yours, too. You're not that much older than me. <laughs> Thank Although you. you are older than I am. I am. I'm well, older than older anybody older. I know. <laughs> well, that may be true. But you don't look your age, Denise. Ah, Thank you. I mean, you. we talked about this on the sit rep before. You are a tennis hard body. <laughs> Okay. You've got definition. You've got definition. All right. Thank you. you. At least you did the last time I saw you. <laughs> All right. You could have turned into a big pudge between now and then. Uh, not so much. All right. Good for you. Good for you. Keep that hard body. All right. So you've only got now, since I've eaten up the majority of this uh, segment, seven minutes. What are you going to talk about for seven minutes? Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, quite the moment in history that we went through. But the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, finished their report. They issued a 141-page report. And it's really quite remarkable. Um, the people, the, the time... The expense, the staff, the phone calls, the tracking down that was done. And I, I just got to tell you that there is now a second criminal referral to the Department of Justice um, for another girl by the name of, whose last name is Leighton. I forget her first name, but it doesn't matter. She had written a letter, signed it Jane Doe. It got to Senator <clears throat> Kamala Harris's office, and she finally admitted that she just did it as a ploy. She'd never even met Brett Kavanaugh in her life. <laughs> so, um, I'm sorry, I, I said it was 141 page. It's a 414 page um, report. And... Uh, there isn't anybody now that has substantiated any part of Christine Blasey Ford's testimony, much less any of the other accusers. Nobody. There are a couple of names that are redacted, because, but they, you know, you can pretty much figure out, you know, who's, uh, why they were questioning them um, and, and having some kind of privacy on this thing. But, um, one report, this is kind of interesting, that three people who knew Ford when she attended the University of North Carolina told the committee that Ford had a robust and active social life there, contradicting her statement to the committee that the incident with Kavanaugh resulted in her living a limited social life. <laughs> now, there's likely at least one or two more that are likely going to also be referred to the Department of Justice for false testimony and lying to uh, the Senate, which, is, by the way, is, in fact, a felony. It is remarkable. Yeah, who, was, who was the first one? Who was the first one? Julie Swetnick yes. or whatever Swetnick. her name is? Yes, yes. All right, and this, and this Jane Doe is now uh, identified as who? Um, her last name is Layton. She's got a hyphenated right. name, too. Uh, is is the Department of Justice going to? Press we don't know. We we he, he, we don't know. All we know is that it, they've been referred to them. All right. Okay. Carry um, on. it is 
<laughs> it, it it's just fascinating. Um, I mean, I couldn't read the whole 114 pages, although I'm, you know, probably 200 pages into it. Uh, the people that, uh, that the Senate staffers had to reach out to and, and kind of get rid of all the fluff that was coming out of MSNBC and CNN and, you know, uh, Avenetti and all this other kind of nonsense. I mean, it was extensive. And I would also tell you that the chairman of the judiciary, uh, Senator Grassley, has also said it's really not finished yet. Um, this was just a report on those interviews that they had done so far. So, Do we have any idea how much this cost us? Well, I think that's going to be really the second part of his report. Because I would say that not only should there be these criminal referrals, but the cost of the staff having to do what they did, the security for all the protests that went on, the whole Diane Feinstein thing, I believe there ought to be some tallied cost associated with this. And not only should there be criminal referrals, but some of these people ought to be sent a bill. I don't think Dr. Ford ought to be spending her $900,000 quite yet. I don't either. <laughs> now, yeah. the fascinating thing is we have an opportunity as a result of this report. And, you know, I, I would suggest that anybody trot on over to the Senate Judiciary's website, committee's website, and you can see the report there. Um, I've also posted Are you, you going to post that on founderscode.com? I will get to it um, probably tomorrow to do that along with the uh, cover page that uh, Grassley wrote that went not only to Sessions but also to Christopher Ray, the director of the FBI. All right. Well, you got a minute left in this last minute before you continue with this, uh, because your fidelity is always better than mine on uh, on my cell phone here. Give everybody your website address. Tell them how they can sign up for things and, and get your newsletter. OK, well, the the web address is founders with a, with an S founders code dot com. And there is a tab there where that you can sign up to receive email. So anytime I do a post, you will get it in an email. Um, so I will make sure that I post this stuff on Kavanaugh tomorrow. But I would also say before we go to break real quickly, where's Kamala Harris apologizing? Where is Cory Booker apologizing? Where is they're not uh, going to? They're not going to. I think there we we need to get on social media and start demanding apologies. I agree with you. That's a good note to end on before we go to break. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to the Drive Time Sit Rep, the Drive Time Situation Report with Denise Simon, the ever-stellar intelligence analyst and the host of the Denise Simon Experience, and myself, my name is Don Newitt. I'm the co-host of Cowboy Logic Radio. We're going to be back in three minutes. Check us out on the web at cowboylogic.us. Hi, thank you for listening. My name is Ron Phillips, and I'm the owner and operations manager of Talk America Radio. It is with great pride that I offer you this 24-7 stream of some of the finest talk radio programming in the country, but I need your support. We are a listener-supported network. That means we need your help to continue to offer the quality programming you're hearing right now. If you're able, please visit TalkAmericaRadio.us and click the Support Us button. Your donation will go a long way in helping us continue to share the American voice. Thank you. This is Denise Simon, host of the Denise Simon Experience. When I'm not debating with Donna Fiducio about politics, I listen to Cowboy Logic Radio. Why, you ask? Because outside of my blog, founderscode.com, and my own radio show, the Denise Simon Experience, Cowboy Logic is by far the most entertaining and informative radio show on planet Earth. Plus, Don makes me feel guilty if I don't listen to his radio show every week. <laughs> 
Hi, this is Donna Fiducia, co-host of Cowboy Logic Radio. For 28 years, I was in the mainstream media, most recently as an anchor at the Fox News Channel. No more. Ladies and gentlemen, the mainstream media has completely failed the American people. Radio networks like Talk America Radio will not fail you. Radio shows like Cowboy Logic Radio will not fail you. Check out the entire roster of over 60 weekly radio shows by visiting TalkAmericaRadio.us. That's TalkAmericaRadio.us. Can we do it again? I like it. <laughs> this is Denise Simon. 18 hours a day, I live in a world as an intelligence analyst. Intelligence analyst. Intelligence analyst. Intelligence analyst. Intelligence analyst. What I find is reprehensible, what I find is terrifying, what I find is treasonous, what I find is treasonous, what I find is treasonous. The mainstream media has completely failed the American people, failed the American people, failed the American people. Join me for the Denise Simon Experience every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Drive Time Sit Rep. My name is Don Newen. You've got on the other end of this conversation, the wonderful Denise Simon. I am barreling down I-20 headed west, headed home late night on I-20. Denise, I'm going through Douglasville right now. You know that city well. Kind of well. Well, you never lived here, but you know it well. (laughs) Okay, okay. You know it's on the west side of Atlanta. I do. You know there there's a mall here. You know that. Yeah, I do. Have you ever shopped at this mall, Denise? No. Arbor Place Mall? No, no. You know what this mall is now? No. It's a hangout for deviants. This is where millennials that have nothing else to do go every night. It's why we all use Amazon.com to buy stuff. Because we don't feel like hanging out with a bunch of millennials that have nothing better to do than hang out at the mall. And pull your damn pants up. All right. So, Denise, we left this before we went to break. You were talking about the Kavanaugh hearings and the report that was issued, the 414-page report that you've read 200 pages of. We were talking about some of these criminal referrals that either are made or are going to be made or need to be made. And some of the penalties that should be incurred for some of these fraudulent claims against Kavanaugh. In addition, how do we hold some of these key players in the Democrat Party responsible for these irresponsible actions? I would bring every one of them up before the Ethics Committee. That would be for starters. Not that the Ethics Committee has any teeth to it, Ethics. because it it doesn't. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, it is kind of a demerit, if you will. Well, it would uh, go on the record, right? That's correct. Yeah. Now, for instance, if Senator Kamala Harris gets a letter from a girl that lives in, I don't know, Kansas, that decides that she, this latent person, that she's just going to write this letter and sign it as Jane Doe, and they really had to work hard to track this person down. And I mean, they had to work hard. And she goes, oh, I just did it for some attention. Have you ever met Kavanaugh? No, Lord, no, were her words. Okay, they spoke to her. All right, so why didn't Kamala Harris's office do that when they got the letter? Or did Kamala Harris set it up? 
So there's there's more to necessarily be uncovered, if you understand where I'm going with that. But well, this uh, could bury her for 2020. Well, we don't. It, it, if for nothing else, she never should have submitted it. She should have gotten with the committee and said, um, "I'm concerned about this. Let's go down this path together to see if there's any uh, livability in this letter." Or well, you her, know, they didn't. They didn't do I, that. I, were, that's what I'm saying. She it. should have done that. Right. Oh, okay. No, I agree. So, um, as a consequence, uh, I think there are many. Uh, Kirsten Gillibrand being yet another one. Oh, I believe her, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I'm the one that kind of stood out there all by myself going, this never happened to Christina Ford. And that's pretty much where we are. It never happened to yep. her. Yep. Well, this event most certainly didn't. Now, well, I would something be... ever did... You know, you know, we had a congressman from South Carolina by the name of Joe Wilson. And in the middle of a, a joint session... Liar! Of, you lie! He yelled out, <laughs> you lie. And they censured the guy. And they, yeah. and then under Nancy Pelosi, they wanted him to travel to all 50 states and personally apologize to somebody. I don't know who. And he goes, you know, I'm a Southern gentleman. I've already apologized once. I'm not doing it again. But I would say that under that same premise... That the Kamala Harris's, the Cory Booker's, the Kirsten Gillibrand's, the one from Hawaii, whatever her name is, you know, that said all 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 white men ought to right. just shut up, stand up, right? Um, and and you know the rest of them, they ought to be censured, and maybe they ought to get on uh, national television together and walk up to a microphone and personally apologize, not to just Kavanaugh. But especially to him and his wife and his family and his mother and father who were there. But additionally, I would say to all of those poor people on the Senate Judiciary staff that had to pick up all these pieces and go investigate it. And then to us, because it cheated us for days, didn't it? Yeah. It was a fabricated lie. So, I, I you know... We don't; those people don't have to travel to all fifty states like they want Joe Wilson to do. But get on television. But are they going to do that? No, because you heard what happened on Saturday Night Live, right, with Dan Crenshaw? Yeah, yeah. And I happened I to be with it. Dan Crenshaw. I heard about it. And I happened to be with Dan Crenshaw and interviewed Dan Crenshaw when I was in Washington two months ago. <sighs> Has NBC apologized to Dan Crenshaw? No. Not in any way, shape, or form. For bad taste. I tell you what, for the listeners that didn't see this or haven't read about it, why don't you very briefly explain what Saturday Night Live did? Well, he, he, he was a Navy SEAL. He did three, t on his third tour to Afghanistan, an IED blew up and took out his eye. The uh, Navy wanted to, um, you know, discharge him on a, on a medical discharge, and he said no. He did two more tours, by the way. He's running for Congress out of, uh, I don't know which district of Texas, but it's in and around Houston. Um, remarkable fella. And so on Saturday Night Live, you got this young 20-some-odd-year-old comedian that gets on there and starts to make a joke. And I don't, you know, I've forgotten how long since forgot the joke, but they made a joke about him and his, how his eye that was, he's, you know, wears a patch. They made a joke of it. Reprehensible. And nobody, yeah, graceful. Yeah. nobody has apologized. Nobody even. And then you've got a few that are actually giving this, this cat, um, it's Saturday night live. A pass because he's so young. He's a millennial. I'm sorry. But you know, my teenage sons in their worst moment never would have done anything like that. Yeah, it's somebody wrote it, the script. It was, it was pathetic. Of course they did. It's those lame ass SNL writers. All right, so That's the, why the show hadn't been funny since John Belushi was on it. The point of this is 
You've got a tactic that we've just described on what they did to Kavanaugh, what they did to us, what they did to several other people, um, those being the, the Democrats. And then all the protests, we forget all the protests that went on days and days and days, days all over the Capitol. And then we have this thing with Saturday Night Live. I'm just telling you, whatever happens as a result of the midterm elections on November the 6th, good, better, and different, these tactics are not going to go away. They've now laid the standard. And, and so I would start by shaming some of these people, and it's up to us to do it because these people are civil servants to us. Um, in, in Congress, I would be shaming these people. And then I would just be saying, you know, whatever happened to manners, whatever happened to courtesy, whatever happened to statesmanship? Um, we lost as a, as a nation, we lost manners in the seventies. Well, we, do you um, not agree? I, I, mean, I don't know when it started, but I can, I can just tell you this. Um, watch, we've got, all you got to do is watch television. All you got to do is watch television. And you can tell by the, the, the way TV shows were and are when we lost manners. When we lost, when we lost the societal respect. Now, many of us stay, you know, we were raised the, the right way. But I think, you know, Donna and I watch all these old TV shows as a, as a way to get away from things. Shows like Cannon and Mannix and The Rifleman. Those kind of shows. People handled themselves differently back then. Now you watch TV. And, and you got to pray to God that your kids aren't even in the same room. Especially if they're in their formative years. Well, speaking of ultimate manners, as long as you're in the old things, if you ever can track down the movie A Bad Day at Black Rock with Spencer Tracy, I suggest you watch that. Because of what this town did to this man and how he handled himself. And I don't know a yeah. man today that would have done the same thing, except for may I say, Dan Crenshaw, and how he handled this thing with the Saturday Night Live. Hey, uh, how's he looking at the, uh, for the election? I can't really tell. Um, I, don't, I don't watch that race, um, but uh, it, it appears that I think that he's actually doing pretty well. But I don't Good. know what, what that necessarily means as far as well, numbers go. Hey, all, you know, like we were talking about before we went uh, on the air here, Ladies and gentlemen, and again, this this show is being recorded Monday night, November 5th. So we don't know what the outcome of the election is. And by the time you hear this show on Wednesday night for the first time, we're all going to know. But what I said to Denise is because she was like, man, I am so ready for this midterm crap to be over. Me too. I well, agree. there's a couple of things here, and, and and that is is that now we have we have under we have actually seen the tactics of the left for two years, and how it has it has escalated, and I would say it is not plateaued. Um, going up through the Kavanaugh hearing, but then you know, in your state and in my state, we have two governorships that are really in peril here. <laughs> And I, I can't. Be, even, hold, hold on, it's beyond me. It is beyond me how Gillum is even polling. Well, I will say this, by the way. Do you know? Did you see the video over the weekend where this little girl goes and throws some kind of a drink in some guy's face, and she's got on these short shorts with a denim jacket, and she's calling everybody Nazis? Did you see no, that video? Okay. No. Well, by the way. She happens to be a Florida State student. But by the way, she's also an intern on the Gillum campaign. And has been arrested for assault. Yeah, good for her. 
All right, let's while we're on the midterms, and again, you know, this show's obviously the night before the midterms that we're recording this show. What is your gut telling you about the gubernatorial race in Florida? I have a friend that is running for Congress in um, Florida, in one of the districts up by um, uh, Northeast Florida, whatever it is. And uh, Flagler College up there did a mock um, election thing. And actually, he came out well. And Governor Scott prevailed as senator over Nelson. But... Gillum prevailed over DeSantis as governor. It is, that's beyond comprehension. It's beyond comprehension. (laughs) Yeah, it it really is. Here's an interesting thing about Gillum, too. I decided to really go uh, poke around a little bit further. The FBI investigation on Gillum is not a new thing, by the way. It began in 2016, and it was initiated by a few members of the legislature because of what he was doing with some kind of Community Reinvestment Act money. That's the genesis of this whole thing. So um, the FBI sent in three agents, all operating under a pseudonym. There was a Brian Miller or Mark Miller and some other guy's name. And that investigation is not over. The reason that they're not really going anywhere with it is because apparently the FBI has this standing cockamamie rule that when in the election cycle, they don't interfere because they don't want to alter the election outcomes. I would say, what? <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, if, if he is elected, they continue this investigation. They could bring charges against or they could recommend charges and then we end up with a very progressive christian progressive as he calls himself lieutenant governor as governor and i don't think this cat's any really any better than gillum so what happens to your state denise the state of florida if gillum gets elected what are the what are the beautiful changes you're going to see take place Well, again, um, whatever he thinks he might want to do, you know, you have a Florida legislature that uh, is responsible. I mean, he can't just do things willy-nilly. And so we necessarily would have to tend to to watch things. But if things start to go south, you're going to see a particular address go up for sale. Because I don't think I want to live in the state that's got, uh, you know, I I live here because it's an income tax-free state. Right. That's one of the reasons. I could just decide well, I'll, you, I'll move to Tennessee. You and the majority of people that are over the age of, you know, 55 are down there for that very reason. I one guarantee you Neil Bortz is going to get the hell out of Dodge. Well, I might end up in Tennessee, I don't know, or Texas. All right, well, let's talk about Georgia. Now, you probably saw the video on social media of three or four black guys walking the streets of, I'm assuming, Atlanta. Actually, it was West Uh, End Atlanta, yes. Well, and that's a damn war zone. Yeah. With what appeared to be some ARs. And uh, I also didn't see any magazines in in uh, in the guns. I could be wrong, but the pictures that I saw, I could not see any clips. But they're still walking around carrying these weapons on the streets of Atlanta while they're carrying Stacey Abrams signs. Now, what is your gut telling you about the Georgia race, even though you're not living in Georgia right now? I haven't really kept up too much with it, but there's yet another caveat to this whole thing. And that is where Kemp um has referred the case of some kind of hacking or some kind of voter database issue over to the cyber authorities at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And uh, I saw media over the weekend, they were attacking Kemp on this whole thing, saying it's there's a plot here and it's false 
nothing like that ever happened, and that included Stacey Abrams. But apparently there is something to it um, for him to make this referral. So uh, your race is as nasty and ugly as ours is, um, but I would say for kind of different reasons. You know, we've had Obama down here. We've had, um, what, what's his doodle? Uh, uh, God, uh, the, the, the activist that used to do the wrestling thing. Who am I trying, oh, what am I th thinking of? He was an F, he was a snitch. He's on CNN. I have no idea. Yeah, you do. Okay. Uh, God, well, maybe he's just not. Maybe he's just not relevant. <laughs> uh, and and then we had kinda Senator, like, kind of like Alec Baldwin, who's no longer relevant. Well, I mean, they're all endorsing, you know, Gillum. And then I'm looking at the <laughs> news down here, and I'm like, oh, Al Sharpton's who I'm thinking of. And, oh. Big yeah. little body. Right. And so where is the media talking about, you know, uh, Gillum and all the other things that he was doing, not just the whole FBI thing, but using the, the states or the city, the mayors, I should say the mayors, petty cash fund to pay for personal stuff. You can't the, do that or you're labeled a racist. You just can't do it. You can't do it. I did kind of get attacked by some girl that said, I just, I was responding to WFLA. Uh, they put out something and I said, I just want you guys to report all the facts and not do selective reporting. And then she comes back and says, oh, so you would prefer fake news. Well, what part of all of the fact, all of the facts did you not understand? <laughs> it's not in the agenda. Just not in the agenda. Meanwhile, um, let, let's trot on over because nothing else outside of rallies and elections is being reported. Nothing. But here's an item that should be reported. And that is that the United States, along with several other countries, is doing a military exercise. Um, it's a NATO exercise that's in and around um, Norway. And uh, the U.S., Mount Whitney uh, had launched some planes, and here come not one but two Russian planes that got so close that we had to make some pretty life-saving maneuvers from pilots. Wow. Yes. Now, wow. This is all being done in the Norwegian Sea. It stops, I think, on the 8th. It's called Operation uh, Trident Juncture, is this military exercise. It's not a small one, by the way. Um, then there was apparently some kind of a radio intercept that the United States got that says, this is to inform you that the Russian Navy planned to rocket test firings in the basin of the Norwegian Sea. <laughs> so while we're over there with several other countries and a whole bunch of assets, here comes this TU-142 and, you know, all this other kind of nonsense that's that's happening. Where, in a, and I'm looking at the maneuvers that we had to make up, you know, north of Glasgow and Aberdeen, Scotland, in, in, the, in the North Sea up there. And it's chilling what these pilots had to do to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, the point being, the beat goes on in the rest of the world, and we're all consumed with, you know, John Tester and Maxine Waters and, and you know, uh, Menendez. You see what I'm saying? I mean, uh, and governorships. Absolutely. Which is one more reason why we're ready for the midterms to be over. I'm as ready hey, as Denise, I can. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, listen, we got about three and a half minutes left. I want to ask you a question that my dear 84-year-old father asked me the other night. And I gave him an answer, but I'll be very curious as to what your answer would be. He was talking about this caravan of people that are coming up from Central America through Mexico that are going to embark on our southern border. And we are deploying military assets down there to, uh, to enhance the border patrol. His question was this. What do we do with all these people when they show up? What do we do? 
How does the military play that role? What role do they play? What do we do if they start throwing rocks? What do we do if they start using small arms or weapons? What do we do? Where do we put them all? What do we do? So you got about three minutes. Well, a little less, about two and a half minutes. Well, the point of most of what is happening here is we working with Mexico saying to Mexico, they better not get here because it necessarily won't be pretty. Now, the very first ca caravan has now it's down to around 4,000, but there are three caravans behind it. And the total number of all four caravans is back up to the twelve to 14,000 range. So we are putting some major pressure on Mexico saying, we're going to ship these people back. You figure out a place to put them because they ain't coming here. We're not accepting them. Period. We have something called first free, first free country doctrine. Right. And the first free country doctrine is actually uh, through the United Nations. So the first free country is where they needed to apply for asylum, which would have been Mexico. And they didn't want to do it in Mexico. They could have done it in any of our locations in Mexico. So they're not coming here. So what they're doing is they're essentially layering the border. So border patrol will take these people, they'll gather them up and, and you know, put them on. We, we've got all these convoys. We've got all these transportation. So we're just put them on a bus, send them right back. They're not spending the night. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? We don't have to have tent cities. We we're not, we're not going to go through that again. Gotcha. So they will be turned around and they will, they be, will be turned back around in Mexico. Whether it be on, on leased vehicles or military vehicles, but their 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 butts are being turned around and they're going back someplace on that side of the of the border. That side of the river. They're not coming here. Period. Which is the reason they filed about sixteen of them, really in like two filed families. Lawsuits. Filed a lawsuit. <laughs> what a joke. Hey, we gotta end it on that. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to the Drive Time Sit Rep with the stellar Denise Simon. My name is Don Newen. Please check out her show Thursday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, The Denise Simon Experience. You can listen to that show on whatever station you're listening to this show on. And if you want to have some fun with Donna and I, catch out Cowboy Logic Radio or check out Cowboy Logic Radio Tuesday nights, 9 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, we do this for you, and we sure appreciate the fact that you've given us one hour of your time. Denise Simon, take it home for us, girl. Thanks for listening, and God bless America.